Good evening. Welcome to Worship at Patchwork in our virtual space. I'm in the physical space, but you all are in the virtual space. And I guess I'm also in the virtual space as well as being in the physical space, even though you're not here in the physical space, but you are there in the virtual space, we're still together. That's the important point. So I'm going to give us just a moment for everybody to join us here for our time of worship. I'll check uh, on my phone, kind of keep track of who's showing up. Um, So please take a moment and join. So one of the things that we do to gather ourselves into community, whether we are physically present or uh, present through this video, uh, is that we say our names. So please feel free to add your name in the comments section to let everyone know that you're here and to know that we are together and our presence is with one another in this time. And as I said, I'll be ch- uh, throughout the service, I'll be checking my phone for uh, comments and names and things like that. And uh, even though there's a little bit of lag time, I will hopefully be able to incorporate some of this into the service. Good. So we have several folks joining us. Excellent. The next thing that we do to bring ourselves into community and to celebrate with each other is to lift up celebrations. The one celebration that I saw on the calendar right before I started this is that this Wednesday, June 24th, is Helen Fisher's birthday. So happy birthday to Helen Fisher. And uh, I'm not going to sing because that would not be a gift. Um, So if you want to sing to Helen wherever you are, uh, wish her Uh, Happy birthday this Wednesday. I'm sure that messages and cards and all forms of uh, celebration and birthday wishes will be accepted and appreciated. So if there are other birthdays or anniversaries, please put those in the comments section if you want to share those. All right, well, I think I'll get started. So for the past uh, couple of weeks, we have been talking about a passage in the book of Revelation, the Revelation of John, John of Patmos, who wrote down these visions uh, probably somewhere near the end of the first century CE. And of course, the first thing that unfortunately we have to say in our context is that this book of Revelation is not meant to be interpreted the way a lot of American Christians want to interpret it. In other words, it's not meant to be taken literally. It's not meant to be predicting events in our present or our near future when it was written a couple of thousand years ago. It was written by a persecuted religious minority in the Roman Empire. It was written by and for those people in that time and place. And it is written in a very spiritual, metaphorical, coded language that talks about their oppression and persecution, their longing for God's realization of God's new kind of earth, new kind of human society, uh, what they often called the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God uh, that was compared and contrasted to the earthly, very unjust empire of the Romans in which they were uh, living. So this, this is the context of the book of Revelation, and we need to keep that in mind and not think of it uh, the way, unfortunately, so much of uh, popular American Christian culture thinks of it, uh, but instead really take it on its own terms. And in that sense, I think we'll see how it still does apply to the modern era and modern life, and especially the modern life of people of faith, but not in the way that a lot of folks thinks, think uh, that it does. So uh, we're going to continue with this. Uh, we're going to go uh, continue with Revelation chapter 16, verses 1 through 7. And here is that text. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple 
telling the seven angels, go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. So the first angel went and poured his bowl on the earth, and a foul and painful sore came on those who had the mark of the beast and who worshipped its image. The second angel poured his bowl into the sea, and it became like the blood of a corpse, and every living thing in the sea died. Then the third angel poured his bowl into the rivers and the springs of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters say, You are just, O holy one, who are and were, for you have judged these things. Because they shed the blood of saints and prophets, you have given them blood to drink. It is what they deserve. And I heard the altar respond, Yes, O Lord God, the Almighty, your judgments are true and just. So the last couple of weeks, we've talked about these visions uh, that have preceded these seven plagues, these seven bowls of wrath. The first was a victory celebration, even before the plagues had been released, even before the struggle for justice had been completed, because, of course, that is the faith of uh, these people, of this visionary John of Patmos, uh, and the faith uh, for those of us who believe that ultimately good will triumph over evil, justice over injustice, love over hate and apathy. And so we started out with this vision of the saints and prophets standing around a sea of glass mixed with fire. We then moved on to a vision of the holy temple of the tabernacle in heaven with the seven angels flying forth and their, they were wearing clothing that was fitting. It was golden clothing, but it was fitting for hard labor and long journeys that they would have to do for these bowls of the wrath of God to accomplish their mission of justice and creating a new earth. And so uh, we come now to the actual plagues, the actual bowls. It's been leading up to this for quite some time, but now we get to these and we have the first three plagues, the first three bowls uh, here. So let's take them one by one. Revelation chapter 16, verse 2. So the first angel went and poured his bowl on the earth, and a foul and painful sore came on those who had the mark of the beast and who worshipped its image. Now this foul and painful sore is reminiscent of the sixth plague on the Egyptians in the book of Exodus in the Hebrew Bible. And if you'll remember, I've said over the past couple of weeks that the language of Revelation and the imagery of Revelation is soaked in the language and the imagery of Exodus in this ur-liberation event for the people of Israel, uh, this founding myth uh, of those people and of the faith and so this is an incredibly important story to inform and to understand more deeply the visions in the book of Revelation. So in uh, the book of Exodus chapter 9, verses 8 through 10, Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Take handfuls of soot from the kiln and let Moses throw it in the air in sight of Pharaoh. It shall become a fine dust over all the land of Egypt and shall cause festering boils on humans and animals throughout the land of Egypt. So they took soot from the kiln and stood before, Mo before Pharaoh, and Moses threw it in the air, and it caused festering boils on humans and animals. So taking this word for boils, it is uh, sometimes translated as sore or ulcer. And it's the same word used in the book of Job to describe the sores and pains that covered Job's body. But more importantly, it is found several times in the book of Leviticus in chapter 13, which is all about these skin blemishes, these sores and boils and ulcers on the skin, and how the priest determines whether those sores and boils are leprous or not, whether it makes the person unclean or not. And that was a huge and very important question in that society, whether someone was clean or unclean. Because if you were considered ritually or religiously unclean, then you could not worship at the temple. You could not buy or sell in the marketplace. You could not eat at the same table as clean people, even your own family. 
So this was incredibly important. It was a major social boundary, this clean versus unclean. And if you were unclean, you were left out of a whole lot of the common life and flourishing of the community. So uh, the priests would examine you, let you know whether this boil was made you clean or unclean, or sometimes what the priests would do, and this has echoes of what we're doing right now and what we have to endure right now, sometimes the priest would say, well, you need to stay in quarantine for seven days. You need to stay in quarantine for a week and then see what happens to the, to the sore or the boil on your skin, and then we'll see whether uh, you can come back into society or whether you have to stay in quarantine or whether you have to live in a leper colony outside of the boundaries of normal society. So in this book of Revelation, who does this uh, foul and painful sore afflict? It comes on those that it says, had the mark of the beast and who worshiped its image. Now remember in uh, previous sessions, we've talked about this, who worshiped the image of the beast, and this was a reference to worshiping at the idol of the Roman emperor. The Roman emperor would have his statue set up in major cities around the empire and would have subjects of the Roman Empire worship that idol along with their other idols. Now, different parts of the Roman Empire, maybe people had different pantheons, uh, not just the Roman or Greek pantheon, but other uh, uh, gods or goddesses that they worshipped. But the Roman emperor wanted to make sure that his statue was among the ones worshipped, uh, no matter what other gods or goddesses people worshipped, uh, that they worshipped the idol, the image of the Roman emperor, which was also a metaphor for the entire empire, the whole state, the whole power structure of Rome. So, so those are the people uh, that that uh, are have this that are worshiping the image of the beast, or the ones who worship the idol, the statue of the Roman emperor. And um, let's see. Sorry, I lost my place. Oh, yes, so now we have to look at what does the mark of the beast mean? Now, remember when I said at the beginning that uh, the book of Revelation, there's a lot of uh, really, in my opinion, really bad misinterpretation of this book about how it applies right now and how it has these, uh, it ties into modern day conspiracy theories. And this is one of the big ones, this mark of the beast. So if you go on the internet, you'll see all of these crazy conspiracy theories about how the mark of the beast is uh, a microchip that Bill Gates wants to implant under your skin so that every movement can be tracked and and everything about you can be known. Um, Now, of course, a lot of people do that already with their phones. They can be tracked and their data is gathered and aggregated. So the, but anyway, we, we'll, we won't get into that right now. Or uh, so, some people have said, you know, there are always these conspiracy theories that the government is about to, about to pass legislation that will uh, somehow create this mark that everyone will have to have in order to enjoy the benefits of citizenship or, or something like that. You know, you, everyone will have to get a barcode tattoo on the back of their neck. Uh, or else, you know, they'll be thrown in prison or something like that. These, these crazy conspiracy theories, uh, these are, this has nothing to do with the mark of the beast and what this meant in this vision in the book of Revelation. So the mark of the beast um, was originally in Greek, the word is karagma, karagma, and it means a stamp or an impress. It started as a word used by artisans as a technical term for an etching or an engraving. But eventually it took on just a general meaning as a mark of undeniable identification, a brand, any kind of mark or symbol that was immediately identifiable and immediately identified you and connected you with whatever, whether it was a certain uh, business or a certain nation or a certain religion, whatever it was, it immediately identified you with that. So this mark of the beast is the branding of the empire. And in this case, it's not a literal uh, brand that might be used on cattle, although John of Patmos may have intended uh, this kind of pun, this kind of humorous image of people following the leaders of the empire and worshiping uh, the statue of the empire like branded cattle being led to the slaughter. And it means this brand, this mark of the beast, 
means that someone lives his or her life in such a way that the person is undeniably identified with Rome, with the empire, with what John calls the beast. It means you're not just a nominal member of Rome. It, it, it doesn't mean that. It means someone who freely and intentionally devotes their whole lives to the Roman Empire, someone whose time and money and energy and even the psychology of their inner mind and their inner thoughts is all supportive and cheerleading and completely engrossed in the Roman Empire. Now, that would have described a lot of your typical everyday Roman citizens back then. Imagine a man who was a paterfamilias, the head of his household, a man who worked in his father's trade, who gave his sons to serve in the Roman military, who followed the same basic Roman religious practices that all of his neighbors practiced, someone who considered himself a patriot and a man of faith, and that the two were inextricably connected with each other. Such a man would have adorned his home and his clothing with symbols of Rome, symbols like the Roman eagle and the Roman fasces. The fasces was a symbol, it was a bundle of sticks with an axe bundled in there tied with leather thongs. And as a side note, both of these symbols, the Roman eagle and the Roman fasces, were appropriated in the 20th century by Nazis and other fascistic reg regimes and our English word fascism actually comes from that Latin fasces, referring to that symbol of those bundled sticks with the axe in the center as a symbol of power and authority. Now, it didn't matter that these people's intentions were good. It didn't matter that their neighbors were all doing the same thing. It didn't even matter that they thought of themselves as pillars of their community and good Roman citizens. Their daily lives provided the raw materials with which the Roman Empire in every sense was built. Their labor, their money, their families, their psychology, their faith. All of it undergirded that Roman Empire that was built on violence and greed. So this plague is about making the polluters the polluted. Those who carry the mark or the brand of the beast, the ones who are the good patriotic Romans, the ones who enjoy all of the social and political privileges that that entails, they are the ones who are now struck with the boils and the sores and the painful eruptions of the skin that, make, that are not only physically painful, but make them socially unclean, put them outside of that society that they have spent all of their life and energy and time and family and psychology to help build up, they are suddenly the marginalized. They are suddenly the outcast because of these painful sores and boils on their skin. Now, in contrast, the ones that John of Patmos calls those who have conquered the beast, the ones who refused to worship the statue of the emperor, the ones who refused to have their lives, their labor, their money, their families be eaten up by the Roman Empire and digested and metabolized as energy for that empire's further existence. Those people, the ones that refused, the ones that resisted, the ones that non-violently withheld all of their support from the Roman Empire, even at great risk, to their livelihoods, and even their lives. People who risked imprisonment and even death for refusing to worship the statue, for refusing to serve in the Roman military, for refusing to have their lives be the thing that supported the Roman Empire. Those are now the people that John of Patmos says, those are the saints and prophets. Those are the ones who get to bask in the presence of God eternally. Those are the ones who are admired and lead in the new world order that God establishes on earth, a new world of justice and peace and love. So these, this reversal of fortune is a big part of this book of Revelation and this vision of these plagues. Now this plague also... Uh, echoes the Exodus story when the tenth and final plague against the Egyptians spares the Israelites as it passes over, as in Passover, 
It passes over the houses with the mark of the lamb's blood, but the plague afflicts the houses of the Egyptians, the ones who are convinced uh, of Pharaoh. And it was the final it was the, uh, the final wrath, the final plague that killed the firstborn sons of Egypt. And it was the beginning of Israel's liberation from bondage in Egypt. Now, of course, John of Patmos, like everyone else in his day, knew about real-life plagues. They knew about disease and famine and war and dozens of other varieties of large-scale death. And in that world, plagues were never fair. They never passed over the righteous and the deserving and only afflicted the ones who really deserved it. But this is a vision of a very different kind of plague. Remember, this is a vision, a spiritual vision, a metaphorical vision, a vision of liberation. So this isn't about real diseases or real uh, earthquakes or real any of that stuff in a literal sense. This is about a plague that is a metaphor for God's wrath and God's justice that comes to earth to reshape earth and human society in God's image. So let's move on to uh, the second plague now. The second plague is very strange and also reminiscent of part of the Exodus story. Here it is. The second angel poured his bowl into the sea, and it became like the blood of a corpse, and every living thing in the sea died. Now compare this to the first plague in the Exodus story in the Hebrew Bible. From, Mo- from Exodus chapter 7, Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord commanded. In the sight of Pharaoh and of his officials, he lifted up the staff and struck the water in the river, and all the water in the river was turned to blood, and the fish in the river died. The river stank so that the Egyptians could not drink its water, and there was blood throughout the whole land of Egypt. Blood. Why does it always have to be blood? Why can't it just be, you know, a little saliva, sweat? Isn't there some other bodily fluid they can pick other than blood? But no, in the ancient world, blood was a powerful symbol, possibly the most powerful symbol. But it was an ambiguous symbol. Now, blood on the positive side could mean life, health, vitality, but only as long as it stayed inside the body coursing through the veins where it belonged. Because blood that was spilled, blood that transgressed its flesh-walled boundaries and flowed outside its proper vessels, that kind of blood symbolized violence and uncleanness and pollution. So notice how John's vision changes a few of the details from the plague story in Exodus. Instead of just afflicting the river Nile, the blood plague affects the sea, the ocean. And the first plague, the one in Exodus, just kills the fish, but the one in Revelation causes every living thing in the sea to die. The plague envisioned in Revelation happens on a much grander scale than the one in Exodus. And I think it's because the symbolism is meant to be this is liberation not just for one people, the people of Israel. This is liberation for all humanity and even all of creation. That all of the, the, all of this is bound together in a story of liberation, uh, and not just uh, for one part of creation. Second, notice that the blood of the plague in Revelation is not just generic blood, it is specifically like the blood of a corpse. And this detail might have been added to emphasize just how unclean and polluting this blood was. Remember that in the Hebrew Bible, touching any blood is unclean, but also touching a corpse is unclean. So this is not just unclean in one way, it's unclean in two ways. So this blood is not just polluting, it is super-duper polluting and unclean. And because this blood is so highly symbolic, notice that the text says, the sea became like the blood of a corpse and every living thing in the sea died. And it doesn't mention the color, so plague may not be red in the literal sense. The blood from a corpse would represent violence and pollution. 
And I think, G, uh, I think John's vision is not talking about the sea literally turning red like blood. I think the vision is saying that the sea becomes violent and polluted and the creatures in it die because of the violence and pollution that the plague represents. Again, this is a plague that affects not just one set, one uh, community of human beings, not even all of humanity, but all of creation. And I've noted before that in the book of Revelation, the natural world is represented by the four living creatures. And those four living creatures, or just one of them, often work together in, con- in concert with God's angels to do the work of God's justice, God's wrath against evil. And I think this is another instance of that truth. So then we'll move on to the third plague. One-handed, sorry, I couldn't resist. So let's go on to the third plague. The third angel poured his bowl into the rivers and the springs of water, and they became blood. And this description is closer to the description of the plague in Exodus chapter 7 that I read, in that it affects the rivers and the drinking water instead of the sea and the creatures living in the sea. So the third plague focuses on the way that the pollution of the blood, the pollution of the waters, also affects human beings because we can't drink it. We can't get sustenance from the water that is polluted and unclean. And then it says that the angel of the waters responds to the third plague with this song, with this sort of musical interlude. And it's, it's a very odd thing to think of this, but imagine this vision of plagues and then you know, immediately after the third plague, we get, a, we get a little song break. We get the angel of waters comes in and sings us a little song. It's, it's, the book of Revelation is very weird. It's, and like I said, it's very dreamlike. So you're going along, you're having these visions of plagues, of sores and festering boils, and a plague of you know, the sea turning like the blood of a corpse and killing all of the living creatures, and then a, a plague that pollutes all of the drinking water so people can't drink. And then we get an angel singing a song. That's just how this book goes. So we get an angel singing a song. And I heard the angel of the waters say, You are just, O holy one, who are and were, for you have judged these things because they, meaning the the, uh, followers of the beast, um, they shed the blood of saints and prophets. You have given them blood to drink. It is what they deserve. Now, it was a common belief in John of Patmos' time that each of the four elements of the universe, air, earth, fire, and water, all had an angel, a spiritual personification or entity that ruled over it. And the angel of the waters would have been in charge of all of the water on earth. So this angel or spiritual personification of the elemental force of water also joins with these saints and prophets. Like I said before, we earlier had the the four living creatures joining the angels. We have the angel of waters, the elements of creation joining with the saints and prophets. It's it's, uh, Revelation's way of saying all of this stuff is interconnected. It's not just a human issue. It's not just an issue for one community of humans. It's all humanity, all creation. We are all and all of, all of the spiritual realm, uh, all of the spiritual realm of angels and uh, other spiritual entities, that this is all interconnected. So this angel or spiritual personification of water joins these uh, saints and prophets uh, in this work of bringing justice and liberation to all of creation. And the angel sings a song worshiping God because God's justice is fitting. Because they shed the blood of saints and prophets, you have given them blood to drink. So this, these plagues are not just sort of a, a call back to the plagues of Exodus and, and updating them and expanding them and putting them on a grander scale. It is also an ironic way of transcendentally punishing the crimes and the criminals of systemically murdering God's servants and polluting God's creation. Because the empire, the Roman Empire and all other empires, cannot suffer true saints and prophets to live 
because the saints and the prophets, their faith, their message, their way of life, their essence, their soul, their spirit is a threat to the empire because the empire is always built on lies and hypocrisy and greed and inequality. And the message of the prophets and the saints is always anathema to the empire. So these plagues are not just about punishing evildoers. They are about tearing down this whole system of the worldly empire and establishing a new kind of empire that is more in God's image, that is more about equality and justice and truth and love. So with this interpretation, I think it is clear that these three plagues, while they may not be literal predictions of what's happening now. I don't think we can, you know, we can't make any kind of parallel of that first plague of painful sores to it's literally about COVID-19. That makes no sense. There's no, there's no connection there. But the way that I think they do connect is that these plagues talking about the interconnection of humanity and creation and the spiritual realm, all interconnected, all fighting the same fight for justice and liberation is, I think, just as relevant today as it was in the first century CE uh, during the time of John of Patmos. So today, those with the mark of the beast or the brand of the empire are those who buy into the myth of American empire, American superiority. They see the U.S. flag as an icon of faith, something almost to be bowed down to. Patriotism is a religion, quote-unquote, supporting the troops is absolute dogma that can never be questioned. It is people who use their labor to undergird the systems of, of economic injustice. It is people whose religious beliefs are combined between America and their form of Christianity so that for them the two are completely connected and inextricable. It is people who take for granted the systemic injustices upon which our nation was founded and, and, which, and who enjoy the privileges of those injustices. White privilege, male privilege, straight privilege, Christian privilege, all of which I enjoy. But these are people who devote their lives, their energy, their body, their family, their psychology, their faith, all of it is directed toward this. And this is the mark of the beast, the brand of empire, the undeniable identification with this system of power and authority and injustice. And like I said, these plagues about the sea being polluted and becoming like the blood of a corpse and the rivers uh, and the springs being polluted and so the drinking water is undrinkable. You know, we see, we see this in global warming. We see this in massive islands of floating plastic in our oceans. We see this in all of the air pollution around us. We see this in the environmental injustice, that that pollution then disproportionately affects people of color, people who are marginalized, people who are not part of the in-group. So I think you can see that this these visions are just, just as important and just as relevant and speak to us today, maybe not in exactly the same way that they spoke to Christians in the first century in the Roman Empire, but in very similar ways and in ways that I think can uh, inform our faith and draw us deeper into connection with each other, with creation, with the spiritual realm, and with the fight for liberation. So now I'm going to... Uh, read the last part of this. In the last part of our section, the altar. There's an altar in the midst of this uh, vision, and this altar sings back in response to that angel, that angel of the waters who sang about how just and fitting God's punishments were. So this altar uh, responds with song. I heard the altar respond, yes, O Lord, the Almighty, your judgments are true and just. The altar is the personification of an altar from several uh, chapters earlier in the book, in Revelation chapter 6, verse 9. And it says that it is an altar under which dwelled the souls of those who had been slaughtered for the word of God and for the testimony they had given. This altar is the spiritual home of those saints and prophets who gave their lives proclaiming God's gospel of love, truth, forgiveness, 
compassion, liberation, and justice. This altar affirms what the angel has said about God's judgments being just and true. In the original Greek, this word for altar is thusasterios, and it is not just a physical place. The altar is a spiritual nexus where God meets the true worshiper, where the temporary mortal encounters the eternal holy one. And the true altar does not have an address. And this is an important truth for us to keep in mind during these days of social distancing. The true altar in our mind, in our heart, our spirit, coming into the presence of the Holy One as we engage in acts of true worship. It doesn't even have to be when we're sitting uh, watching this on Facebook Live. It doesn't have to be when we're at prayer or meditating silently. When we call a friend and share our love, we are at the true altar. When we give of our time and money to bring justice in one way or another, we are worshiping at the true altar. When we social distance and wear masks and wash our hands frequently out of love of the neighbor and care for those whom we love, we are worshiping at the true altar. Those are acts of worship. When we examine ourselves carefully, acknowledging that in our own lives, we have some of those marks of the beast, some of those brands of empire. We have some of those privileges, whether for you it's white privilege or straight privilege or whatever privilege uh, may come along with your existence, whether you asked for it or not. But when we examine those privileges and when we consciously fight to dismantle those systems of oppression that give us those privileges... That is an act of worshiping at the true altar. So friends, let us read this book of Revelation. Let us see these visions in a new way. Let us understand that they are calling us to join, to join each other and all of humanity, to join the saints and prophets of the past, to join the angels in the spiritual realm, to join the four living creatures and all of creation to join in this mission of liberation and justice and bringing wholeness to earth and coming to the true altar. Amen. So we are coming to a time of prayer. Uh, I have a couple of prayer concerns here, but if you have other prayer concerns, please put them in the comment section and we can all lift them up in prayer together. Uh, Prayers that I'm aware of, uh, we need to continue to keep Nelia Kimbrough in our prayers. Uh, She had a further episode of atrial fibrillation. She had some trouble breathing. Uh, She was taken to the hospital, I believe it was Thursday morning. I don't know if she's still in the hospital or not. Uh, She had to have some fluid on her lungs drained out of her, um, and so she and she was having some trouble breathing, of course, because of that fluid on her lungs. Uh, So, so Nelia is still very much in need of our prayers for healing uh, after the surgery from the cancer. Um, Are there other prayer requests to lift up? Of course, we celebrate with Helen Fisher on the occasion of her birthday this Wednesday, and we celebrate her and all of the ways that her life has been uh, a way, a, a vessel uh, for God's love uh, to shine through her and to enlighten uh, all of those around her in so many ways. Uh, she is such a gift to the patchwork community uh, and to so many other communities, to, I'm sure to her congregation and to uh, Kiwanis and to all of the other organizations she's a part of, as well as her family and Evansville and beyond Evansville. Uh, so we, we celebrate Helen Fisher and we celebrate for her birthday. Uh, Sean Craddock is saying uh, prayers for her sister-in-law, Christy. Uh, so keep Sean's sister-in-law, Christy, in her prayers. Um, And Jill, uh, I believe Jill's uh, also asking um, prayers uh, for her sister uh, who has multiple myeloma. Uh, So for those folks, we need to keep them in prayer. Okay, 
I'm saying, and uh, so today, because it's Father's Day, uh, Sean's sister-in-law, Christy, this is her first Father's Day uh, without her father, Butch. Uh, so that's uh, the reason we need to keep her in prayer. Um, so let's join together in a spirit of prayer, wherever you are. If you wish, uh, just join together in a spirit of prayer, and, uh, and I will lead those. God of all creation, God of the physical and the spiritual, God of the mortal and the eternal, we come before you, we place ourselves on the nexus of the ordinary and the divine, this spiritual altar. Wherever we are, we are coming to that place, to that place in your presence. And we are lifting up all of these prayers. We're lifting up prayers of healing for Nelia, We're lifting up prayers of comfort for Christy, being the first Father's Day after the loss of her father. We're lifting up Jill's sister and healing for multiple myeloma. We're lifting up healing for our nation from all of these systemic injustices, all of these marks of the beast, from racism to ableism to patriarchy to white supremacy, all of the ways that These injustices shape our world and make a society that is unequal, that is full of greed and violence. We ask that your bowls be poured out and that the work of your liberation be joined by humans and animals and angels and the seas and all of creation so that your kingdom, your empire, your way of life may become real in every sense. God, we ask all of these prayers that we speak aloud, and we ask all of the prayers that are silent in our hearts and minds, in your holy name, and through your divine power. Amen. So we also have the empty bowl on our table as a symbol of receiving gifts And we not only want to receive financial gifts that support the ongoing work of Patchwork, but we want to receive gifts from all of you, things that you have received uh, that have made your life joyous and that we can then share and that in turn makes our life more joyous and more bearable, especially in these times of isolation. Um, So if you wish, you may share some uh, gifts in the comments section. I'll share a few that we have here. Um, it is a gift to have outlets to speak out for justice. Uh, And I know for a lot of people, physically being present at a march or a protest uh, is not always safe or not always advisable. And so having these uh, online and other kinds of outlets to make our voices heard, to make our work for justice more concrete, uh, these are gifts. And, And the organizers that help uh, make it possible for us to do that. Uh, they are gifts to us. And I'm going to lift up just one example in particular. Uh, it's called the Poor People's Campaign. And this is a campaign for justice for the poor of all races, for economic justice in our nation where uh, inequality is at one of the highest levels uh, in a hundred years or more. Uh, so it is this form of equality inequality and greed uh, that we are fighting for, the liberation from this economic inequality and economic bondage. Uh, So if you want, please look up the Poor People's Campaign uh, and join your voice uh, to that movement online. Um, Other gifts? uh... Oh, Darlene lifts up. It was a gift, uh, the celebration of her birthday on Friday. We had a, a group of us Uh, that we kept socially distanced, but we got in our cars and we paraded past Darlene's house and we yelled happy birthday and we honked our horns and we had signs and balloons and gave cards uh, to celebrate Darlene's birthday because, of course, she is such a gift to us at Patchwork and to our community, and so we wanted to give back and uh, give her a gift for her birthday on Friday. So that was a gift uh, for Darlene, and I think it was a gift for all of us involved to participate in that. Uh, And then I'll say, I had another gift uh, later Friday evening. Um, I'm a big movie buff, uh, for those of you who don't know, and obviously, uh, you know, I'm not going back into a movie theater anytime soon, 
Uh, but on Friday, I got the chance to go to a drive-in movie. Uh, and so getting to experience a drive-in movie uh, for the first time in quite a while was a gift for me. Um, so find, finding ways to enjoy those experiences in safe ways uh, is, is something that I, I, I encourage us all to try to do more. Uh, I know for me that, that drive-in movie meant, meant way more than the actual uh, story on the screen, which was you know just mediocre, but the drive-in movie was a wonderful experience and a gift. Are there other gifts to lift up? We are a people richly blessed, and for all of these good gifts, we give God thanks. We come to a time for communion, and this communion bread is another gift in a couple of different ways. This is, uh, bread was cr- made by Darlene, again, which is always a gift that she and Nils uh, bake the communion breads for patchwork. Uh, this one in particular, Darlene said, was a gift for me because it contains chocolate and peanut butter, which is my absolute favorite flavor combination. Uh, so this gift of chocolate peanut butter bread for communion, um, you know, I'm, I'm reminded of the verse, uh, taste and see that God is good. And for me, you know, what more proof of God's existence do you need than the taste of chocolate and peanut butter together? Um, So at this time of communion, we come together and we remember that the altar sang. The altar has a voice all its own. Now in my tradition, uh, the Christian church, Disciples of Christ, congregations say that the altar is whatever the table is sitting on. Sometimes it's a raised platform, sometimes it's just the floor like it is here. And for a lot of people, you, when you think of an altar, you think of uh, something made out of uh, stone or something like that, and usually about the size of a table. But in my tradition, we say that the altar is that which the table and everybody around the table sits on, because the altar makes us all holy. It's not just the bread and the cup and the elements that are holy, by gathering around this table, by gathering in community, we all become holy. We are all sitting or standing on the altar. And we come to this altar to give our entire selves, to become those living sacrifices, to give of our labor, our time, our money, our families, our psychology, our whole being, directed not toward the empire of inequality, not directed toward the empire of injustice and greed and violence, but we direct and sacrifice our entire lives toward an empire of God, of love, an empire of forgiveness, an empire of justice, an empire of compassion, an empire of liberation. And so when we bring our entire selves to this altar, and not just the physical space, but to that spiritual altar that is the nexus of the human and the divine, then we are true worshipers and we are true communicants sharing this meal together. So as you bring your own elements, your own bread or crackers or whatever you may have at hand, as you bring your own cup filled with your own drink, whether that is wine or juice or milk or water, whatever it may be. I invite you to share this meal with all of our siblings. Share this meal with Jesus and his disciples. Share this meal with God, the creator, the God of love. Share this meal on the altar, the spiritual place where we all meet. Because it was on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus gathered with his friends in the upper room and he took the loaf of bread and he gave blessings for it and he gave thanks for it. But then he broke it. He broke it apart and said, this is what's going to happen to me. I am going to be broken apart. I will be broken, but I will not die. And if you want to be part of me and if you want to be part of of that resurrection life and power, then you will partake 
of this bread, you will partake of my body. And after supper, in like manner, he took the cup. And he said, poured out in this cup is the new covenant in my blood, a new relationship, a new kind of reconciliation between heaven and earth, between God and human, a new way of joining human to creation, to spirit, so that all becomes one. And Jesus said, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine with you again until we drink it new in the new empire that God is establishing. And so I invite you to take your bread, whatever that may be. I invite you to dip it in your cup. And I invite you to eat together. And now our worship together, our worship at the true altar, maybe not the physical altar, but the spiritual altar, the altar of God's presence where God meets us, where we meet each other spiritually, where we come together around this table on the altar. And now we will move on into lives that we hope are directed toward the visions that we have had at this altar. And so I say to you, God's peace, and I say, let the children of God, the people of God, all say, Amen.